Welcome to the Author Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Kurt. And I always finger point, and then I forget that most of our audience is listening to it anyway, and it doesn't matter which direction I point my fingers. Um, this is our podcast about anything and everything off-road. Uh, maybe off track for me tomorrow, but if I go off track, I'm 100% sure I'm in deep shit. So yeah, don't do that. Two, I, I was told like five minutes ago, two off is a timeout, four off is you're done for the day. Uh, and then I also heard like, if you glance a rumble strip, they're also also uh put you in timeout so um yeah i'm not i'm not planning to touch any rumble strips it's also road america where there are walls very close (laughs) that's a high (laughs) consequence track yeah exactly oh man so uh for the for the audio listener i'm on the road which is why i don't look like i'm in the normal spot uh this is not my bedroom right now it is well Technically, it's my bedroom, but it, I don't own this bedroom. <laughs> I'm not paying a mortgage on this one. No. Uh, I'm in Wisconsin and in Elkhart Lake, and Ross is in a completely new location. Yep. I'm uh, in a bedroom I'm paying a mortgage on. Well, it's not a bedroom, it's an office, but still, yeah. it, it's yours. It's and mine. For Kurt's sure. in Salt Lake City. You got it, Salt Lake. Yeah, just south of Salt Lake, but we'll call it Salt Lake. You guys get Does snow that- yet? We are getting snow. Nothing outside, but uh, our mountains are getting pounded. There's a fresh layer up in the mountains above us here. Yeah, it's coming say, Thursday, they say. Thursday, okay. Thursday. Shit. Yeah. I've still got weeks though. <laughs> Just keep it, keep it west. I don't actually. Yeah. That's north, but, but west. Yeah. Our know. our our friend who lives in Colorado, she posted snow yesterday, but she was she's in nine thousand feet, so she should yeah. have snow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I saw Glacier was like, this section of roads closed, and I was like, oh man, it's coming. I'm not ready for winter yet. I'm sorry. My uh, my best friend lives in Denver. They have a ski house up in silverthorne and he said it snowed in the mountains over the weekend and he also i'm just going to show you i'm going to relay this via via the worst way to do so but he oh, brought please his, don't send it via slack because i have no way to pull that no, he, he brought his okay. toma in for an oil change and they the technician found i don't know if you can see that those are mushrooms in growing in bay. his car no wow. some kind of animal was was hibernating in the engine bay and they have a full I don't know if you can see it at all, but a full Ziploc bag was worth of mushrooms under That's a Tacoma crazy. Bag. Yeah. Were they at least like morels? Like were they decent mushrooms? No, they were neither that nor hallucinogenic. So nothing fun. <laughs> <laughs> um so industry news is that I'm mean, rebel rally still occurring. Go um on. I need to update my my I, my standings on the teams we've had on the show because uh, I think I saw Sedona and Lynn were down to six. They're in six. They've been in six for the last two days. Yeah, I mean, the, and the big news is the sandstorm chaos that's been going on over the last Shamal like conditions. Oh, it looked like. <laughs> yeah, and I know um, Rochelle's there too, and it just looks like everybody's just getting. It's so, can you imagine what the paint's going to be like on the on those vehicles afterwards? <laughs> Rough. I, I saw that they let them all sleep inside of their cars last night because the wind was blowing tent sideways. So oh, they made man. a allowance Shit. and said you can at least hunker down inside of your vehicle. Oh, it was that God. brutal. Tents were blown away, busting stuff. So yeah, I don't think many of them got good sleep. That's terrible. That's bar. At least it's equal playing field. Like if you're gonna well, sleep like, inside your vehicle, you sleep everybody. Yeah, is. Yeah. But that was Rough also that was also after everyone's longest day. Like it was the yep. longest day of checkpoints and then they didn't get to sleep. Sucks. That's terrible. <laughs> anyway, so um, Rebel's going on. Still rooting for everyone we talked to had on the show. Um, yeah. And then Ross, I don't think we ever talked about this next industry point that we had on there, that Forerunner and Tacoma were going to a global platform next. No, I think we mentioned it very, 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 very briefly, but there's swirlings that the Tacoma and Forerunner are going to share a platform again, but it's going to be a global platform. There's not really much else. Um, you know, the assumption is that there's going to be a, a better transmission, hopefully something with more than six gears. And if there if there is forced induction, um, not that the current automatic six speed has been super well received in the tacoma world uh the six speed auto tacoma or nine speed auto frontier um six speed manual tacoma is that still a thing yeah yeah for now yeah for well for now that's again that's what i was saying before the internet cut out but yeah the um Speculation is the possibility of Tacoma's manual going away, which is, you know, everybody's all up in arms and shit, but 
I, I don't know. Nothing's real this far out. You know, Toyota likes to milk things forever. So could be. Oh, there's your wife <laughs> in the background. I know. It's all new tonight. I know. Everything's new. Um, so yeah, it, no, that, real fast, old, old man, like not great, but like, I'm not sad if manuals go away. Like I'll buy an old shitty car to have a manual experience. I'll buy a freaking lot of Neva. We've been talking about it forever. I, three or well, like, I think like 1300 bucks gets a running driving example. It's like $7,000 <laughs> to then ship it right now. So yeah, you pay more for the shipping than the car's worth on any day. Exactly. Right. So particularly right now. It's true. Yeah. I, I uh, sit in the port for six months. I just spent more on a rental car to drive an <clears> hour <throat> and 15 minutes than I did on a pl- two plane flights to get Believe from it. Kansas city to Wisconsin. Believe it. Wow. Yeah. Guess who's not happy. Uh, my wife <laughs> trust me i i campaigned for weeks trying to get a ride from milwaukee to elkhart lake and nobody had an open seat that sucks oh anyway anyway um that's that's kind of the news other it's than news. on coming shows i should have a bunch of feedback about wagon ear grand wagon ear uh raptor bronco 392 wrangler maverick t-rex yeah, which you're gonna get a lot of seat time i see I know I'll get a lot of seat time on the street. I don't know how much I'm going to get of it off road. Actually, um, later we can discuss which like three to four I really need to angle for in the coming days because there's not enough time on the off road coast course for the number of people right. and the number of vehicles. And I just found out autocross is canceled because there were only three autocross vehicles. Oh, uh, that's fine. Um, yeah, I don't so, know. I think you should. Uh, I think you should petition to get the TRX out on Red America. <laughs> who cares about rumble strips and that thing like, <laughs> how many quarters can you just completely Jump. skip entirely <laughs> there is it's a totally like, different track there's an uphill to the left where you have to break before the bridge and like all i can think about is carrying enough speed to like jump it and then miss the point <laughs> like <laughs> anyway there's so many so many statistics or things that can go wrong there. I will, I'll go through my, yeah, my amazing. updates. Cause I'm already talking about it anyway. I'm in Elkhart Lake. I'm going to drive some stuff on road America in the coming days. Um, I did not tear off the lower balance that I have been teasing for weeks. I did modify it though. Um, I got to get to my pictures really fast so I can share my fancy pictures. I got a new phone and they were weird. So um, I got a four image sequence, super, super fancy photography. So, Kurt, I have a 2017 Suburban. We bought it just because we have too many kids. Which screen did it, did it share there? Did it share None. <laughs> That's that the most weird. exciting part. No screen got shared. It's still not doing there. it. There it is. Still not- uh, yeah, I mean, most of it. We, we have um, like two-thirds of the front end. That's so weird. Why is it weird? Um, anyway, so the lower balance... I've been wanting to like come and just tear it across right here and underneath it, there is a plastic piece and there was, it was connected differently than the videos I'd watched before. And so I kind of chickened out. And so basically what I did is I put painters tape across here and came in with an angle grinder and just took the bottom inch and a half off. It's not, it's not terrible. No, that that looks good. It's not, it's not, I'm sure I'll go with good, but uh, I haven't heard it scrape in a parking lot yet. I need to, uh, when I get home, I'll refill on gas and then I'll, I'll report back if I've actually lost any MPGs or not. Um, but yeah, I have seen some stuff on like Z71s where it's a much cleaner look there on the bottom. And so I just seem to figure out what I need to switch out. And this space has definitely got tow hooks that are going into it soon. Mm. Um, just because, yeah, with my 22s and Michelins, I want to have the ability to get out of those spots. Especially going into winter. <laughs> yeah. So it's not like the 08 Sequoia is has the Toyos and the 18s and is ready to go, where the 2017 Suburban is the daily that I have that isn't ready yet, but it's the one I can sleep in the back of the best. <laughs> so I need to get some stuff figured out there. So... And then also being laid off work most of the summer definitely slowed things down. So all kinds of stories <laughs> that tonight. Nice. That'll, yeah. that'll change the budget a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely adjusting the budget on buying some 18s. And 
like the Michelins when I got it are brand new. I've got 70,000 miles to go in those tires, basically. So just run get a second set. Yeah. Just get a second set. Just keep those for summer and for cruising around and get some, you know, 18s or 17s and, and some it's, ATs and swap them. I still want the tire sponsorship. That's what I want. I want to be like a pro race driver that gets a set of Yokohamas or a set of good years that show up. And it, does, uh, it can just be an allotment, just one set every couple of years. I'm good with that. Like, yeah, I hate buying tires. Well, it's so much. You're going to absolutely loathe hearing my news then. <laughs> I'm good with your news. Whatever your news is, I'm okay. fantastic with it. Because uh, you showed me pictures already. So yeah, I sent you a picture. Tires have arrived for the Jeep, courtesy of Toyo. Woo! And they're going on. Wait, I have how, been... how much courtesy? Oh, no, tell me a text later. Oh, we'll, okay. we'll talk offline. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they're going on the Jeep sometime hopefully soon i have a trip planned to a legal off-road place in massachusetts uh, in middle <laughs> november no it's 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 weird it's maintained by the town but you don't have to have it's it's not like new hampshire vermont with the class four and class six roads where it's you know it's just a road that isn't maintained they actually maintain it and i think that's really just keeping it clean but it's uh yeah it, it should be tough is the goal um, it looks rocky it's basically just a series of ledges it's like it's only maybe a mile or two there like out and back it's, it's not even a loop it's just an up and down but it's it's ledges and boulders and uh four low lockers and gauge kind of stuff so nice. it's gonna be interesting and the uh it's perfect timing with the tires because the km2s that are on the jeep right now are are really starting to show the cracks between the tread blocks, like the little ripply wavy guys that come from just heat and sun and being almost 10 or over 10 years old. So they're 10 years old. They're 10 years old. They were wow. like some of the earliest KM2s. Um, but yeah, so 285, 70, 17 Toyo AT3s and probably get them aired down around like 14 for this trail. So yeah, it's going to be Sweet. fun. Just got to find somewhere to put them on i don't work at a place where i can do that anymore so <laughs> you I can't just go back to the that. dealership yeah. <laughs> no 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 uh, anyways so that's those are my updates and Mount, uh, mountain the house, balancing isn't that bad it's a pain in the ass when yeah. they're when they weigh 90 pounds yeah that's the gatekeeper obstacle at this place so you go up like a little nice. a little rocky hill from the road that it's on and then the gate obstacle gatekeeper obstacle is like a six foot ledge and it's pretty good and high grip when it's dry but as soon as it's you know any kind of moisture and leaf covered it's uh it's pretty gnarly so yeah i love lj, an LJ. Yeah, i love an tacky LJ. lj is the best that's that is the perfect tj lj era uh jeep but yeah that's it's you can't really tell but it's like kind of six feet vertical and uh yeah the perfect have, lj uh, is the sahara movie edition lj stop it stop ignoring my dream car <laughs> i love that movie the, um oh god what was the tj movie prop? the tomb raider tomb, raider. The tomb raider yeah yeah <laughs> not uh, the tj was... tomb raider the lj sahara movie mm-hmm best right. lj ever and we it's talked about that in one of our first shows I, i'll bring it up all the time because there are only three thousand of them made and i want one good luck that'll be thirty five thousand dollars do you know uh there were two listed online a couple months ago and one that was like in disastrous condition sold for thirteen thousand wow. dollars no no there i mean there was a there's a 92 miata in like destroyed beyond destroyed condition right now then they're asking like 10 grand so yeah used car prices are nuts. ignore everything insane yeah yeah anyways those are my updates sweet yeah um kurt where do you want to start bud <laughs> yeah, so yeah. we could we could go anywhere here and i say that in terms of like vehicles and trips but also in terms of places you've gone with them so I mean, we, we got a bunch of show notes here. Chris, you want to kick it off with anything? Yeah. Uh, the way. I, I would just say, like, what's your elevator pitch? Like, how do you, how do you introduce yourself <laughs> to people? Well, I have a lot of irons in the fire, for better or for worse sometimes. 
So uh, my day-to-day job is I have a Land Cruiser shop here in Salt Lake City, Utah called Cruiser Outfitters. Mm -hmm. We've been around since 1992. I haven't been around since that long in the business, but I I purchased it in about 2002. So it's all I've done for coming up on 20 years now. Wow. Oh, wow. Uh, Yeah. And then along the way, I've had a lot of other unique opportunities to travel. Um, (laughs) Did a trip called Expedition 7, where we took Land Cruisers to all seven continents. Yeah, we can kind of touch on those more. And through that trip, I met Clay with Expedition Overland and started doing trips with Expedition Overland. And then we raced a Land Cruiser as well. So I kind of don't that. get I don't ever get too far away from Toyotas in my life. I guess I like them at this point. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> it's a central theme with us, too. So, right. yeah, All I, the family. I had a 94 Land Cruiser. Ross has I, had a bunch of I, I fifth had three. Gen. No, I had two fourth Four. gens and a fifth gen forerunner. Okay. Nice. So. Nice. Yeah. So we we speak the language, and I definitely have bought your front knuckle rebuild kit for the night. <laughs> there were six six weeks of my life that I definitely <laughs> bit off more than I could chew. Um, my dad was a saint and helped me figure all that out. Uh, packing bearings, I'd never done that before. So, uh, which now I work for an industrial distributor, so bearings are all I write about. Which is that's hilarious. how you play with. That's how you know. <laughs> exactly. That's funny. False angle. They had Timkin and Koyo on the list, and I was like, I'm pretty sure I've heard those uh, names before. <laughs> I know those names. <laughs> exactly. Um, I don't even know where I was going with that. So, all right. So, Kurt, so what's in yeah. your personal garage at the moment, and is it a Land Cruiser? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> again, I don't get too far away from Land Cruisers, so I keep a, I've got a handful, a couple 40s and some 70s and uh, – 200s and uh, a mega cruiser kind of keep a few around that you have a mega easy. cruiser i do i've got a mega cruiser but um it's easy when you have a shop see the the missus my wife and she's an amazingly patient human being she really can't say much about it because i'm like oh no no that's a company thing we need it <laughs> we got to test fit parts see what works on it so i have too many right now is the answer but uh yeah i'm fortunate to have a lot of fun land cruisers around and can kind of their company projects, right? Their business expenses. Right. Oh my right. gosh. That's the way to do it. You've cracked the code. I mean, that's- Dude, I might well, drive to Salt Lake next week just because I know that you have a mega cruiser. I'll <laughs> come out anytime. I'll, I'll uh, let you rip around in it. So yeah, I've got a military spec. It's a 1996. So just barely legal on the 25 year old import in the US. And it's a, but it's a military spec with the soft top. So yeah, it's a fun, uh, fun rig to rip oh around gosh. in. Have you wheeled it? Have you actually done on any like yeah like- yeah a little bit i mean they're they're uh they're big they're really wide they're and they're not they're light and i guess in this for the size there but they're still a pretty heavy machine so mm. um, the other part of it is I'm, I'm a little reluctant to like flog on it too hard off road because parts aren't exactly easy to get right and i'm not worried right. about the drivetrain right. so much as it's got a full one piece fiberglass front hood so i'm always worried like man like a you smack a tree or something and it it just start getting expensive. So I'm sharing the civilian version. I know this isn't exactly what you have, yep. but it's just yep. we, trying to yep. find mega cruiser pictures is even harder. <laughs> and we have one of these here in the museum here in Salt Lake in the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum. We do have a civilian oh. version and a, a military version side by side. Civilian versions are extremely rare because they made less than like 300 of those. Somewhere like in the what? 280 oh, wow. ranges, I recall. Yeah, really rare low numbers. And because of that, the values of those things are insane right now. Is it like, like any car? A cheap one's like 90 grand, right? Yeah, and you'd be even hard pressed to find a $90,000 one right now. They'd Jeez. be more like in the 120, 130 God. right now. And again, that's a civilian version. Mine's a military. They're significantly less money. Okay. Oh, man. That's pretty cool. What's the, it's solid front, solid rear? No, they're actually really unique suspension. And that's kind of one of the cool things that I really dig about them is they're IFS, IRS. So they're independent really? front and rear. And they have portal reduction hubs front and rear and four-wheel steering uh, also. So front and okay. rear steer. Uh, you can't control the rear steer separately. So you can't like choose to crab walk or counter steer, et cetera. Yeah. It, it just, once that front end kicks over, it kicks the back tires a lesser degree, but it makes a huge difference in how maneuverable this crazy wide vehicle is. All right, I got That's an image so with cool. the wheels. Turn. So concurrent with them selling the Yeah, 80. there you go. If you look at the oh, rear actually, wheel, you can actually see yeah, that's, it. Yeah. That's a lot. That's like quadra steer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Remember that. But th- so they were selling the 80 at the same time that they were selling that. The 80 was solid, right? Solid rear. 
Yeah. So the 80 series and then even the, and then later into the hundreds and the one Oh fives, which stayed solid axle. So the mega cruiser was a, it was a military project. It was, mm. it was built to be the answer of a light mobility vehicle for like the Japanese self-defense forces. Um, so a lot of people look at it and say, Oh, it looks just like a Humvee. Well, of course it does because we're a partner nation with Japan and we've done a lot of things. I've got some cool photos of a, uh, a U.S. landing craft, like a hovercraft with Humvees and mega cruisers, exactly. Oh, that's, so cool. that's that's mine, the military spec, uh, on the deck of the boat. So they were definitely made to be the same size, fit in the same helicopter, fit in the same plane, etc. So therefore, the dimensions naturally were going to be quite similar. Sure. Okay. So, so I have to. Okay. Chris, real fast. Chris, yeah. The, the TRX is two to three inches wider than this thing. That's Christ. crazy. Right, that that's crazy. Oh. Johnny Johnny Lieberman dropped that knowledge on us a couple of weeks ago, and I, that's what? my most fun statistic to use right now. That is surprising to me. I didn't know that there was any. I mean, Humvee, but I didn't know there were too many production vehicles any wider. And that yeah. that's crazy. The TRX that's is crazy. that wide, and they're just selling that thing. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Mega Cruiser for a lot of people in the Toyota world and in the like off road world. I said. Um, sorry they uh you know the mega cruiser is like unobtainium it's like the it's on a on a podium you know it's like like the pinnacle of odd quirky (laughs) good luck even seeing one of these kind of things so now that you actually have one what's like is that it is there something beyond that or can you like no there's there's no no no, definitely not a piece in my my acquisition (laughs) life there's always more i'm looking for um, one of my other irons in the fire, a hat I put on on certain days is I'm a board member at the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum here in Salt Lake. And we've got a little over a hundred, like 105 roughly Land Cruisers in the museum now, uh, including we've got both the mega cruisers, the civilian, the, the uh, militaries I mentioned, but we, yeah, there's a great photo. Oh yeah. That's a photo I shared just the other day. <laughs> we are missing a handful, nothing super easy to get. In fact, the handful we're missing some of the handful, no one knows if there's really any examples that are left. There's photos of them that existed back in the 50s and 60s, um, but it's hard to say if any have trickled down this life. But that said, I said the same thing about some of the vehicles we have. In fact, that vehicle you can see on the right there, that's called a Toyota BJT. Exactly. That one doesn't even have the name Land Cruiser on it because it predates the name Land Cruiser. Uh, uh-huh. But there were several iterations of the vehicle that became the Land Cruiser even before that model. But if you'd asked me 15 years ago or even 10 years ago, uh, if we would ever have a BJT in the museum, I would have said, like, probably not. Because I've the only ones that were known to exist at that time belonged to Toyota corporate uh, in Japan. So, yeah, there's still so, yeah, definitely still a few Land Cruisers on the bucket list uh, and hopefully track some of them down one day. Mm-hmm. So w- when you have been on the trips like those with the expedition and overland guys do you because the land cruiser is so overbuilt do you end up looking at everything else and kind of picking it apart a little bit or is it you know a vehicle's a vehicle and you can just kind of bounce from thing to thing and, and look at them as themselves yeah, no, I, I don't like not in a disparaging way at all. I mean, I like Tacomas and Forerunners are fantastic platforms. And that's like the most of what we've traveled in with XO in particular, though we do have the XO fleet's got a 200 series. But mm-hmm. you have to also look at like the gross weight of the vehicle versus the drivetrain. It's not like they're underbuilt by any means. Forerunners are fantastic platforms, good heavy duty drivetrain. And the 40 is a fantastic motor. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're great. In fact, the 40, that same one GRFE 40 gas motor, is available in Land Cruisers too. Both uh, all the oh, way really? up until the yeah, you could get a 200 series. Not in the U.S. We all got, we got the V8, but globally, you could get a V6 powered 70 series or a V6 gas powered 200 mm-hmm. series as well. So um, it's still a that. fantastic drivetrain. Uh, the Forerunner is just a little lighter chassis, but it also weighs overall less too. So like power to strength ratio, if you will, there. They're, they're great vehicles. Interesting. I, I had absolutely no idea. I thought it was diesel or or the five seven across the board for those. Um, so okay, I don't want to talk about Land Cruisers all night, but I got one more for you. That's good. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, uh, I don't think you've met our audience, Ross. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's fair. Well, I, I would like to figure out of our audience what percentage, because you know, in like the the driving enthusiast 
world, it's like what percentage? It's like 33% are Miata people, 33% are Porsche people. And then the rest is the other piece of the pie. So I'd be curious to like break down what, what our audience is. But so Kurt, for, for, for somebody who's either kind of like in the off-road world already or getting into it or, you know, shifting from like XJs or, or Jeeps or something to Toyotas, to Land Cruisers, mm-hmm. what do you recommend as like the entry point? What's the, you know, what's the like base level recommendation you give people for where to look? Is it, you know, 80 or you just say well, the most it- you can afford? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, the de facto answer, right, is buy the best, newest you can afford. But um, 80s have gotten, like, completely immortal as of recently, the pricing. And Thanks I guess you have to look at who that customer asking is. If it's somebody that's maybe got a little discretionary funds, they can still find and buy an 80 that's in their price range. But uh, the part I hate about Land Cruisers getting so expensive as of late is, like, the 18-year-old version of myself couldn't afford to buy one of those. So, Um, I think there's other platforms that are great entry level spots and the forerunner is a perfect example, very capable Mm -hmm. machine, plenty of aftermarket support, uh, but really take a hard look at the GX 470 and 460 prices often are lower on those than they are on the equivalent forerunner yet you get the V8 out of them too, either the 47 or the 46 V8 so cool platforms and of course the Tacoma is hard to beat, Um, but in the Land Cruiser world if we're just focusing on like the Land Cruiser buy uh i've 100 series despite being newer and having the v8 so i mean technically a little better drivetrain for most uses outside of maybe the most of technical rock crawling the prices on 100 can be a lot lower than an 80 series and and then look at the lexus version of that which is the lx 470 again Mm -hmm. you can kind of get like a little bit of discount and maybe a vehicle that's been better cared for because often lexus owners spend a little more money on maintenance and have stuff performed at mm-hmm. the dealer more often. That's not always a general rule, but well, there's, it kind of often is the case. There's a number of those examples of the the LX470 where it was mom's soccer mobile. Right. And they've okay. never seen the dirt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. okay, real fast though, because I feel like personally, I would lean towards 100 series. I've, and to be honest, I owned a, uh, I actually owned an LX. I forget about that. Did you really? Yeah, I owned a black O. Or LX for a while. I didn't know that. It became my mother-in-law's car when she came to live with us, ah. and it was too big for her, so it became a Highlander. Um, it, it just transformed. Yeah, it just it went poof and got smaller. It was totally fine, but Crazy. I feel like the only knock on the hundred series is the IFS versus the solid. You you hear guys be like, "Oh, you need the solid," yeah. but do you though? Like, isn't it only like that last five to ten percent where you actually need all that? Well, it's kind of revisionist history, right? Like the 60 series guys were up in arms when the 80 series came out because it had coil suspension and had, you know, all this leather and different interior, this big bulbous body. Mm -hmm. And then when the 100 series came out, both the 80s and 60 guys could unite and they both hated it because it had (laughs) IFS. But fast forward and like the IFS has proven itself. The 100 series is a pretty stalwart chassis. And you're right, if you're doing the Rubicon, if that's like your main goal, then it's probably not the best choice to start with, but guys have done the Rubicon with hundreds and two hundreds, even at this point with IFS and it's the IFS on a hundred series is I would argue more robust than the Burfield of a stock 80 series. Now you can build the 80 series to be stronger with heavy duty Cromali shafts and putting a lot of good components on it, but like out of the box, uh, particularly like a 2000 plus hundred series front end is pretty dang tough. They're, they're yeah. same gears in the diff, essentially the same differential, but better. The CVs are stronger than a Burfield and the knuckles are stronger than an 80. So I don't know. It's, mm-hmm. And and the, the benefit of that is, is like far better ride compliance and, and uh, right. ride quality, particularly on like a washboard road or a lot of the travel that most off-roaders are actually doing, maybe not what they picture themselves doing, but what they're actually doing. Short yeah, of yeah, max articulation. Well suited. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. it. No, that makes sense. I think, yeah, no, the hundred just gets overlooked. I think people like poo-pooing on something and like having something that that can be the butt of the jokes. The same way the NC generation Miata was the butt of the jokes because it was like 50 pounds heavier. You know, it's like pretty okay. insignificant amount in the grand scheme. Yeah, it means nothing. Well, that's right. like but that's that's why I bought a Sequoia because I feel like that gets even more overlooked. 
Sequoia's a great platform. Yeah, they yeah. do get overlooked. I have a five seven V eight. Like it's. Yeah. Yeah. I just need to. I just need to get rid of the airbags. <laughs> I don't uh, trust them. Not the airbags. The suspension. <laughs> the, yeah, the air suspension. <laughs> like the, well, the just, just as the uh, just as the hundred series guys got all the hate from the eighties and sixties, it's, 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 it just keeps rolling down the line. It always yeah. will. I always have to put myself oh, in that mindset that customers or or people that you get on the internet, they're always going to be upset. But everybody was upset about the two hundred series. Like, oh, it's this big bulbous thing, and the five yeah. seven, this big giant motor. And like, fast forward, look today, like everyone wanted to buy the last 21s once they heard it was going away they're all broken hearted like well what is it are you mad that toyota made the 200 series or are you mad it's going away like which is it it's a, the 200 that's what we race that's what we desert race it's right. an amazing like an amazing platform we beat that thing within inches of its life every single race and it's amazing how well that thing holds up and if anyone with a 40 50 60 70 or 80 or 100 series uh doesn't think that i would love to pay their entry fee to any race and we would love to see how they hang. I'm, I'm serious too, because I'd love to race against the Land Cruiser. Yeah, there's yeah. A, the 200 series we race. That thing looks so good. I love no, this but thing. you're right to the point of the prices. I mean, have you seen the prices of the Heritage Editions? They're like oh yeah, high 90s. And the one that I had last summer for a week was like 90. Yeah, which I have also a, it, more expensive than the Lexus. I have a hair. I I picked up a Heritage right at the tail end there, or, or kind of like that call. early this year. I haven't even driven it yet. It still has the plastic and everything on it. I've been kind of waiting to do a build with it. And I've t- I got to be honest, man, watching all the prices of them go through the roof, I'm going like, holy cow, why wouldn't maybe I sell this? But, yeah, maybe it's time to flip. <laughs> I know, business man, investment. But I, I feel so bad even considering that because I like begged, borrowed, and stole to get enough money to, to be able to buy it. And mm-hmm. I've got an older 200 I'm getting ready to sell. So I'm just going to hang on to it. I'm going to do it. But it's seeing the prices on them is insane what they're doing. That's yeah. crazy. It's absolutely crazy. We we had a, a running joke idea for a while. If we could get a hold of the bronze BBSs, because they would bolt right onto the Sequoia. Mm-hmm. And then I was gonna make some decals to put on the D pillar that would look like because that the Toyota Land Cruiser script that's on the heritage, we were gonna stick yeah. that some Toyota right. Sequoia on the we we're gonna we were gonna mimic it, but that turns out cool. those wheels are incredibly expensive and limited by VIN. Yeah, they're, they're kind of tough to get your hands on. I've been I've been hoarding a few sets here and there as they come <laughs> up with a customer project. Hey, I maintain I have the VIN for that one that they gave me last summer. There you go. Well, I feel there like we go. know a guy too now. Yeah, we could probably work <laughs> <Yeah>. something. Homie, <laughs> I, mean, I, I cannot afford those wheels <laughs> right now. I can't even put tires on the Suburban. <laughs> yeah, those are not cheap. Uh, no, they're great. But... So what what is racing a 200 series – taught you anything or is it just like no let's go race more no 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 we a lot of lessons we actually started uh, it's called kangaroo racing a group of local salt lake city guys and we're all we actually all got to know each other through land cruisers we're all land cruiser guys and um ironically we we kicked off our racing career if you will in an old what's called a five car which is a volkswagen based car okay so uh very it's like a five unlimited so it has like a very cool car there's still like some specs that has to meet in to be a five car um, but it actually had a lot more suspension and a lot more travel than like the 200 series we're in now but we raced that for like three years including a couple runs uh you know the baja 1000 and some big races with it had had great luck with it but every single prep we would have to take the motor out and the motor would have to be serviced we'd have to take the transmission send it to weddle a company in california to have them service the transmission one, because we weren't Land Cruiser or we weren't Volkswagen guys, but two, because like there's just companies that specialize in building those, that tranny for the Volkswagen to hold up to racing. Mm-hmm. And uh, when this Land Cruiser became available, it was actually an LX570. We kind of reskinned it as a Land Cruiser. Uh, <laughs> when it became available, we were like all over it because we knew Land Cruisers pretty well. But we also knew that like we haven't touched the, the 5.7, the 3UR in that thing. We've done nothing to it. It's got probably 30,000 race miles on it. Like it has, I don't know, eight or 10 Baja 1000s, a bunch of, I mean, a lot of races, 20, 30 races on that motor and we don't touch it. Same with the transmission, same with the T case. We service them, we inspect them, but we haven't had to do complete teardowns like we were with that five car. But it is, we run in a class called stock full. It's eight class and it is a limited class. So we run factory Toyota upper control arms factory Toyota lower control arms, factory Toyota CVs. We can't touch most of the drivetrain, 
we could just add a ton of suspension to it. So it's got, okay. uh, oh, it was set up by a company in, uh, called Geyser Brothers. They're an Arizona based uh, trophy truck builder. And they, it's got, you know, a lot of king suspension on it, both uh, bypass shocks and coilovers on all corners. So it's got an amazing amount of suspension, a full roll cage, all the glasses out, all the, all the interiors out. So it's lightened up significantly, but yeah, it's a fantastic vehicle, but I, we learned a ton because playing with land cruisers all day at my business. Plus I'm going to say 90% of the guys on our team have uh 200s or five seventies. So you get a really good chance to see what's going to hold up and what's not going to based on the accelerated wear that happens in a race. For example, tie rod ends on a race vehicle last about 1200 miles, about one Baja <laughs> oh my miles. God. on a daily driver. You're going to see those last more like, uh, probably like 120,000 miles. I mean, it's a right. pretty like that factor is pretty crazy, but um, I, so we stock a lot of parts here at Cruiser Outfitters based on the things we see failing on the race car. Yeah. There's okay. a good shot of the suspension there in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just like, yeah, really? things that we, things that don't hold up or, and, and they, we never have to repair it mid race. They hold up amazingly well, but just like with any prep, you have to fix them between races and if it's something that we're fixing between races, it's probably something we should stock at our shop here because after a hundred to 200,000 miles, uh, a land cruiser that gets used moderately off-road, but as a daily driver, it's also going to need those same parts. Is there no lift gate on the back? Nope. Whole back's taken off. It's got a custom fuel cell in the back. So kind of hard to see, but there's a fuel cell buried in the back and there's no, uh, no lift gate or tailgate. And then that's the trans cooler you're seeing right in the oh, very huh. back there. How much does a stock LX of that year weigh and how much does that weigh? You know, we, I don't know that we've ever actually weighed it. This is horrible because we get asked this all the time. We've never, we've like driven past <laughs> hundreds of scales and never thought about it. But um, I, I think that we're probably like 400 pounds lighter than the 570 because of all the oh, wow. glass interior that came out of it. Though, mm -hmm. we, though a lot's been added back on. Cage um, isn't light. The cage isn't light, exactly. The cage, the tube work's not light. The fuel cell's not light. But a lot of factory interior components came out. A lot of, a lot of hardware and harness. And then, of course, the rear hatch and rear gate aren't light. Um, so I think my gut would be we're somewhere in the 6,400-pound range, 62 to 6,400 okay. pounds. We're going to weigh it one of these days, I promise. 30 <laughs> races later, you'd think that we'd have uh, right. thrown it on a scale someplace. Are the taillights still active? Uh, the factory ones? Yeah. 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 When they're not busted, they're pretty busted up right now. That photo you had was, she was looking, uh, she was standing pretty tall at that point. Fresh out of the shop. Yeah. It was, it's, uh, yeah, 2014. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. And we, yeah, that was kind of early on. It's, it's a little rougher now, but we've also braced it all season. We, we raced, uh, there's a local Utah series called Boar Bonneville off-road racing. We raced their full season, which is four races, including a, we just did a 400 mile race on Saturday. Okay. Oh, wow. Wow. So, oh man, I, I can't even imagine driving something that heavy like at that speed. Like, it's a whole lot of machine moving down the trail. But so it's four, it's full time four wheel drive. Still runs the factory mm -hmm. full time four wheel drive system. Um, so it has pretty horrible handling in a corner on a dirt road, as you can imagine. <laughs> Land cruisers were not ever known for their high speed cornering uh, performance, but off road it kind of does that as well. But the four wheel drive kind of counters that to some degree and helps because. A lot of times we're in real low traction surfaces, as you're seeing now through the sand or silt beds, and we'll pass trophy trucks that are bogged down in a silt bed. And this old four wheel drive land cruiser just goes like just chugging right through. Mm -hmm. So we kind of win a lot of races or, or finish a lot of races. Uh, it, it's a war of attrition out there. We're not, we know we're not the fastest guys, right. but we have an amazing finish rate at, uh, at our racing. Like we're somewhere in like the, Man, close to 90 95 percent finishes wow. versus race start. that's amazing it's it is and like most races are more like 50 percent attrition on a like a baja 1000 mm -hmm. so we've had really good luck at those races Dude. and it's the same thing as you know an overlanding trip or a weekend in the woods with your buddies like it's not really fun if you're not gonna make it the whole way you know not at if, all. if something takes a shit halfway through and you gotta drag it through the woods back or park it and go back to save it like it's not not a good time. Yeah. So no, we, it, it's been fun. We, a lot of that is our prep. We spent a lot of time knowing that, you know, good, good idea of the things that aren't going to hold up and address those as needed, but we kind of are all pretty conservative drivers and we, we push it and we have a lot of fun, but we also know that like my only job, if I start the race 
which I did like I did on Saturday, my only job is not to win the race. It's to hand off a running driving car yeah. to the guys mm-hmm. that take it next. Cause yep. we all put a lot of time into getting it ready. And it wouldn't be fun if I just go out there and run out of talent and <laughs> blow the thing into pieces. Wait, it doesn't, right. it doesn't work that way. It's, it's the, the old uh, adage of you can't win in the first corner, but like you can lose in the first corner. Uh, like you can absolutely lose in the first corner. That's, that's right. like, uh, that's like 24 hours of lemons, the story. Right. <laughs> just that last. Just, yeah. So, so what kind of trips do you have planned? You got anything good coming up? You know, not a whole ton on the calendar quite yet with Expedition Overland. We're still waiting to kind of see what borders do and what international travel looks like. Mm-hmm. It is starting to open up, but, uh, you know, you got to also have to weigh, is it like appropriately responsible for us to be traveling to countries that maybe aren't quite, even if we legally can get there, is it, is it our, our locals and some of these remote areas going to be really comfortable with people rolling in? So kind of weighing some mm-hmm. of those, but uh, I'll be back down at the Baja 1000 next month. And then um, we're going to go see the Dakar rally in Saudi Arabia. Okay. I uh, went over two years ago. We're going to go back in January to watch the Dakar rally. Nice. Did oh, I, that's, that's a race that I still don't, I think, like I still don't understand completely. Like it's nuts. Yeah, It's like, pretty wild. Yeah. Like those guys run flat out. We have aspirations maybe to one day run it, but I, I, to be honest, like the more we go, I, we went down to South America a couple times to watch it when it was in Peru and down in that area. Yeah, I think the more that we've been to see it, the more like we kind of realize, you know, what, it's probably a little out of reach. Mm-hmm. And one of the big things is the way we race with Kangaroo is there's like five or six of us that will drive the car, maybe not at any given race, but at different races, we take turns. Um, but like a Baja 1000, there could be four or five driver changes. Um, Dakar allows one driver. So our kind of current team we have now, we're like, yeah. how would that even work? And I'd be happy to support <laughs> yeah. a buddy on our team to do it. But I, I don't think any one of us wants to be the only person that would race right. Right. in that. Not rock, to paper, mention scissors. The, the huge amount. Yeah, exactly. Rock, paper, scissors. But the huge amount it takes to race that. If a Baja 1000 is probably somewhere in the tune of, I mean, you could do it on a super budget in the five to ten thousand dollar range. That's including fuel and entry mm. fees. Dakar probably starts more like 10, 10x that, like in the hundred k range. So yeah, that's crazy. We'd have to we'd have to get some good sponsors. Like the mm. even like the Dakar support rigs are so insane. Like not the race over vehicles. The top. It's over yeah, the top. yeah, it's crazy. The things that open out like transformers, like, <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. yeah, the cheapest way to do it's probably on a bike, but that's also probably the cheapest way to have a really bad time. Yeah. So. That, we've watched some, uh, some local, local guy from Salt Lake did it. And we were able to go visit him in the, uh, in the bivouac in the pits there at Dakar, man, he did not look like he was having a good time. <laughs> that is definitely like type two fun, right? Like you're yeah. not having fun in the moment. Maybe as you mm-hmm. unpack that memory, like, Several years after the fact, as the PTSD wears off, you several can think cases of beer. Time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe later you think, but he was not having a good time at that point. It's definitely. Yeah, uh, you're right. It's definitely type two. The fun is best when it's over. That's yeah. right. Hey, that's you like that memory. That, that was my trip up in New Hampshire a few weeks ago. Like looking back on it, it was a good time. But when it was 38 degrees and torrential rain and and 30 mile per hour winds and you know no windshield, no cab around you or anything, it wasn't a very good time. You know, forget yeah. this man yeah no fun <laughs> now now looking back on it it's just hysterical especially the drive back drive back was great heated seats in that frontier so spectacularly. Oh, speaking of drives back like exo you guys you drove through most of central america right down to the tip yep. of panama yeah yep all the way to panama and, and you film all the way down is the drive back better because no one's filming anything <laughs> Yeah, totally. Uh, and that's a person, that's a total personal opinion. I'm not a camera guy or do I have any talent behind a camera? So I'm the first to say like, I'll roll up. Generally what I've done on those trips is like the logistics kind of planning the day to day. Like we know we have X amount of time, X amount of miles. I'll kind of put together an itinerary and a route and hopefully hit some cool spots along the way, taking a ton of input and suggestion from the team. But there'll be times we roll up to a place and they're like, I think it's the most beautiful place I've ever seen. And 
you know, internet reviews say you got to check it out or locals told us, Hey, go check this place out and we'll get there. And they'll be like, eh, it's, yeah, whatever. It's kind of cool. Whatever. Let's roll on. And then we get someplace else. And I'm like, I don't see it, man. They're like, we got to fly the drone. We got to film this for the next 12 hours. <laughs> but I will say, and that's because I don't have the talent. Whenever I watch it after the fact, I'm like, Oh man, they were right. That is really cool looking. Yep. Um, all about it framing. Is, all about framing. It is, uh, it, it definitely changes the pace to film as you go. And so, yeah, as soon as the, the cameras turn off, you know, and we, and it's just like in motor mode or we got like a transit leg to get from A to B. Uh, it's definitely a change of pace and a little different atmosphere, but they're really efficient. The, the whole EXO production crew, they're really efficient with the filming and they're, they drive. I mean, it's like some of the, it's the same guys you see on the show. So exactly. Mm -hmm. they are, that's their job, but they are efficient out of it. It slows things down because you know, when you got to get camera gear out or stop and, you know, get the drone all charged up, but we don't really ever like set up shots or pretend like, Oh, Hey, let's go, let's go drive that just to film it. it it's all about where we're actually going. Yeah. The, uh, God, what country? I think it was the, it was the road in Costa Rica that I think ended up like crossing a river, like 40 some odd times or something. Like I, I, I I'm assuming you guys had a local person to help get you to that, but like, that was insane the way it looked visually, especially the drone shots from above. Like it was just, mm -hmm. I still remember that. How many years ago was that now? It's like five yeah, years that ago. Was a, that was a while. That was a really cool area. We did, we had a, a, a fantastic gentleman named Adrian Vera, who's a Costa Rican base. He's got a four wheel drive shop down there and he, he was willing to take us under his wing and show us around. And, and that is an amazing place to off-road. Costa Rica is so friendly, a lot of neat off-roading to do down there. So if you ever get a chance, I would, I would get back there anytime I had the opportunity. Yeah, it's definitely on the list. I we yeah. neither Ross nor myself have been to Baja yet. That's high no, on our list. Got to get down there too. Right. I know. I know. <laughs> Maybe next year. Maybe we'll do do a good trip down there. We'll drive down and actually see some stuff instead of just flying, watching the race, and then turning around and going back. Yeah. But you, so yeah, if you go go during the race or like the week before, week after. That way you can catch a little bit of the race, but then do mm -hmm. some great beach camping and touring. A lot of people are scared away during the race thinking, ah, oh, there's going to be too many people there. But the reality is like, as if you camp on the opposite side of the, the peninsula from where the race is at, you're probably going to have a more secluded experience than you would have any other time of the year. But then there is something special to me anyway, about camping right next to the race course and yeah. like 800 horsepower trophy trucks blasting past camp. Exactly. That's, that's, fucking that's crazy. pretty rad to me. Yeah. That was, I, uh... Larry Chen was telling us about that. He was like, we could, even when we were sleeping, you just hear them ripping past in the oh, middle yeah. of the night. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. So wh where's your favorite spot that you've been to wheel and that you've seen sights from an off-roading or overlanding experience? I love Australia. I've been fortunate to go over there a handful of times just between work and um, just personal travel. Then uh, we did a trip there with the Expedition 7 uh, group. We, we did a big uh, off-road trip through Australia and then with XO and uh, I'm, I'm a Land Cruiser guy, so it's so easy. It's kind of like you cannot throw a stick in Australia without like hitting a Land Cruiser. So the whole yeah. time, I'm like Land Cruiser, Land Cruiser, Land Cruiser, like right. every direction. And it, so, I mean, I take like hundreds of photos, and I like stop at every four by four shop. I'm this like nerdy dude rolling in there, just like, hey, I wanna, <laughs> I wanna say hello. You've got cool Land Cruisers, and it's just so Friends. pop to them. It's like their yeah. day to day. They're just yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I love Australia, and then the the outback, the you know, it's kind of a pun to say that so much, but that, that whole area of out there is so amazing and so remote that you really do have to rely on your vehicle and do it, true self-supported travel. We did a route with Expedition 7 called the Canning Stock Route, and that road is, I'm going to mess it up now because I'm thinking about it, but <clears throat> it's about like, I want to say 1,900 kilometers of self-supported travel. So call it like 1,200 miles roughly uh, through sand, Mm -hmm. hundreds of dunes crossings there was water we got stuck i mean it was just amazing and we had to carry all our food fuel water uh to do that trip right. which is pretty pretty amazing because you'd be really well it'd be impossible in north america or at least in the united states to find anything even on that scale as far as self-supported travel right dan grek was telling us about that because he's starting an australian adventure mm -hmm. and i remember looking it up the following day and just been like like driving back and forth across the states you know <laughs> almost that duration just completely off the grid but okay so australia goes a notch higher on the list of must-dos chris hear that sure 
Yeah, if you're, I mean, you guys, the four by four culture there is just so massive. It's cool. They're giant four by four shops and you know ARB super centers and TJM and all these like mm-hmm. awesome places. It's pretty cool to walk into a shop that feels like a Costco to me. You know, it feels like a giant. <laughs> just packed and it's just such a way of life over there and i mean i guess that's a big part of it is they put winches and bull bars on their vehicles because they need them not because it's a style cue or a you know a hobby for them it's like a Mm. it's a lifestyle truly is a way of life over there to travel in those remote areas yeah different way of living i know in connecticut it's like if i do anything with a lift or tires or it looks like it's been on dirt i'm like Oh my God. Oh my God. Somebody like, you know, want to meet them. Yeah. It's like somebody, somebody actually is like knowledgeable and doing stuff. Right. You know, but Mm -hmm. yeah, I can't imagine being immersed in it like that. It's like going to the, going to Germany and being around, around the Nürburgring, you know, but crazy, crazy, crazy. So what kind of stuff do you guys have coming up is uh, just add into the collection in the museum or got any yeah so so that's a always an ongoing project there's a uh, the founder greg miller has always got his eyes peeled and like uh, the whole team of us at the board of directors we're kind of always looking and, and improving the collection so that's ongoing uh we have grand plans to race next year uh the boar series again which is that local series and then we want to throw in like a big race somewhere else so we're looking at maybe like the the uh, uh the parker 425 or something down in arizona something that range and then um, I've got just, yeah, a lot of little uh, personal training and uh, projects coming up. I do, I know you guys uh, do some of the media events that your, your participants there. Uh, I've got a little, another hat and another iron in the fire where we put, uh, we actually host some of those media events for Toyota and Lexus. So we just did one last week out in Georgia where they'll bring journalists in. So those are always really fun events to be part of. And we've got a handful more of those on the calendar coming up. Toyota's got a lot of fleet changing over the next few years. Yeah. So there's obviously a lot of uh, need and want and need to get uh, people in those vehicles and, and get experiencing those. You didn't get to go to San Antonio for Tundra? No, I didn't go down to that one. We, uh, so we, we actually, when we do them, our company hosts those events. So that one, obviously Toyota was doing in, in-house because they had all their own facilities down there. So when we do them, they'll send us, like we did a, a media drive to Overland Expo uh, Mountain West where they'll send us, I think we had 12 vehicles show up and they'll send 10 participants and we set up the whole event. Uh, and the ones we do are, are off-road events. So we'll okay. take them, we'll spend a few days off-roading. We do, we camped with all of them. We just did one in Georgia last week where we did the same thing. And we'll do anywhere between, uh, you know, like a single overnighter or two and three night trips with journalists or with uh, uh, sometimes, you know, employees within some of these manufacturers and we'll put the trips together and host all that. That's awesome. Yes, yeah, so that's a lot of fun too. Yeah. Are you you were did you do Tacoma? Was that the recent one? TRD Pro? Yeah, we just I've done a handful of Tacoma events as of recent. We just did the Mountain West event. We had the 2022 Tacomas, like the new uh, electric lime, and we had the Lime Rush Forerunner there. And then the drive we did last week in Georgia uh, with journalists also included that. And then they surprised us and brought the uh, the GX, the new 2022 GX over as well. Oh, wow. Uh, it's a, like it's not a full model change. It's not a, a full refresh vehicle, but had like a new interior and a new dash. Mm-hmm. So really cool vehicle you'll yeah. probably be you may be seeing that at your your media project tomorrow because it looks like lexus probably is going to be there yeah and we oh, see man, new i gotta remember the list yeah lx is coming out soon too i think that yeah it's what two weeks how is um uh, the lx they, i think they debut it tomorrow the, is it tomorrow the, yeah the online reveal i think is tomorrow so we're going to start seeing a lot more about the lx 600 cool. coming soon yeah Very cool cool platform so, so i have to ask how is electric lime and lime rush in person better I'll tell you. Like, okay. Yeah. When I, when I first saw them, I, mean, I thought they were cool colors. Toyota always does a maybe controversial hero color. You know, the, there's not everyone loved voodoo blue. Not everyone loved, uh, you know, cement. Some of the right. kind of quicksand. Hero colors. Yeah. Quicksand. Lunar yeah, rock. I mean, they, not lunar rocks, and and they kind of grow on everybody in the end. And I think electric lime and, and lime rush certainly will electric lime that Tacoma looks amazing off-road like you get a little mud on it and like see it mm. in the trees it looks so damn cool and I, th- I think you get some bumpers on it and get some accessories it, it'll uh it'll look really cool I, I don't know that I would own a lime you know electric lime uh, one but yeah I, I can see people would it's, it's a cool color and it, it, it's bold I'm, I'm thinking yep, about it, it I'm thinking about it might be next very bold cool it's very bold, very bold. yeah that yeah, might be next but, for me 
it does look really good when you get them in the out rows. Is this, is this on a, is that like TRD Johns or some of those, some of these pictures are from our events even. So are they? Like, yeah. I just, that picture, search, so. that is a photoshopped picture from the prior model year that they just went in and changed totally color. color change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're still pre production I think they're just now, of course, getting to actual production models within the last mm -hmm. month here. So anything before was like early articles and you know, they were paint match stuff, but so that Very things good. will change. Yeah. That to come. Gotta get a form. Tacoma, was that? <laughs> that was TRD, John. Yeah, that's funny. He was on our event last week. Right. And wow. I have met TRD John before. He's a great guy. Runs a really has a big YouTube following and you has some other social media following. Really cataloging the changes to the TRD lineup for most Toyotas, but they're they're a TRD platforms predominantly. And we were doing that event like a month ago in Colorado, and we had all the fleet uh, at the hotel. And that was kind of one of the first public debuts of that electric line. Though, though it wasn't a public debut, they were they were there for our journalists and our media that were in town. And all of a sudden, like that same night, TRG John had pictures on his Instagram page of all our vehicles in front of the hotel. We're like, how did he get these so quick? But he just got a network of fans that whenever they see something new, they're sharing photos with them. So Dude, that's yeah, awesome. Like six that's six hours it. after we would parked it in front of the hotel, he already had pictures on his Facebook page or his, or his Instagram page about mm -hmm. it. Yeah, it's need a car sneaky. cover sponsor too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right? I, guess, I think if Toyota were really worried about them being shown, they probably would have. That we would have made some uh, concessions there. We've had to do that on projects in the past. I think it was the, these were ready to be uh, let yeah. the public eye see them. We did have them on display at uh, Mountain West Expo as well at well, the that's, Overland. That's something I feel like sometimes uh, some of the manufacturers don't. They, they're like, oh, don't take pictures. Like, guys, it all publicity is publicity. Like, it just mm -hmm. right, yeah. Yeah, you see the guys driving the cam out cars, like flipping the photographers off. Like, we're going to see it anyways. Isn't it good? Like, right. Yeah. You wonder, I don't, I don't put claim to know how all of that works. I think, you know, sometimes they uh, appreciate it when some of those little photos sneak out a little bit. Cause yeah, no, no publicity is bad publicity. Exactly. And there were leaked photos of the electric limes. I mean, there were people seeing them on transport vehicles and people seeing them popping up. So I don't think it was a giant secret. It just, it's amazing how fast uh, the community w wanted to see those in real in, exactly. in person in real life. Yeah. But it's one of those things where the Toyota fan base is kind of rabid. Like they, kinda, it is rabid. And I, I'm guilty as charged. But, well, and, yeah, and we don't, I did. Uh, dude. We don't get new models as often as other vehicles get new models. Like we have to wait a while to get something actually new. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, people are eating up that new, the new the Tundra is making all sorts of news. I'm sure you guys are seeing it everywhere too. Everywhere. We're just seeing like oh, mileage yeah. and pricing and everything starting to come out, and and uh, I think we'll do the same as uh, the other new platforms start to make their way out. Yeah, I just yeah. I need to see a Tundra in person. Um, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of the way it looks in pictures. Not sold yet, huh? I've heard it's better or less less bad. But it, part part of it is like my my Sequoia is, is a platinum level and it's got Chrome everywhere. And so like the versions mm -hmm. I've seen that are chromed out, I'm just kind of like, can I, can I have some lot. Like body color? It's a lot. Like, yeah, it's a lot. It's like but. we're in the sun, like anyone will be able to see it. Cause they're going to be like, what's that other bright spot on the planet? Oh, it's just <laughs> like tundra. My eyes. Okay. <laughs> Last one, Kurt. Then I got to, then I got to call it and get some schoolwork done here. But if no you words. had to uh, pick up one vehicle, that's not a Toyota tomorrow, what would it be? Oh, that's a good one. I mean, I'm really intrigued by the new Bronco. Looks like Ford's checked a lot of boxes. They spent plenty of time doing their research and to get that to market. We've been hearing about it forever. Just not right. on the hard top. Just not the hard top. Yeah. Just not the hard top. Yeah. <laughs> they've been dabbling at SEMA with concept stuff and they've been showing off. So we all, everybody knew something was coming, but I had a chance to see it at King of the Hammers earlier this year. They had some of them, you know, rolling around and put eyeballs on it and spent a little time in the, in the passenger seat. I haven't actually, I haven't driven one yet. Uh, but I'm intrigued by them, so I think that would be the good. End. But it, it would take a lot to sway me from uh, kind of what I know and love. I'm, I'm a little bit of typecast into the vehicles I know, <laughs> even though even though sometimes they're not always the most practical solution, or there may be a better solution out there. I kind of just it's the devil I know. Yeah, too shy. If Toyota would make an extended Sequoia or Land Cruiser like a Suburban, I'd buy it immediately. Like I would, mm -hmm. I would pre-order. Just because I have four <laughs> kids, ready. I need it. I need the space. I hate yeah. that I had to buy a Chevy, but I did just because I needed the space. Oh, just, <laughs> they're, they're, 
beautiful vehicles. There's a lot of great vehicles out on the market these days. And yeah. anybody that kind of tells you that there's only one great option, that's probably not an opinion you should listen to. And, I, and that's kind yeah, of a thing of mine on a total tangent here, but like I travel a lot with different people and different groups and it's not vehicular based. If, if you spend all of your time around the campfire talking about vehicles and everybody kind of comparing notes on why theirs is better than the one you're in or vice versa, like it's not the type of people I want to travel with because they're usually not in it for the experience of like traveling to cool places or right. doing neat right. things. It's they're in it to like their vehicle. Base. And that's cool. Everyone. I, I mean, I love that people are brand loyal. I'm certainly brand loyal, but when it comes to like traveling, I think you got to put that aside and just say like, Hey, there's a lot of great solutions to the same trip. There's no mm-hmm. one right answer. If I end up in a Mitsubishi Montero somewhere in Africa, I'm not going to complain about the fact that I'm in Africa. Like I'm yeah, still, Montero, like, exactly. That's it. Because I'm because I'm in Africa. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. And Monteros are cool too. You exactly. Know, yeah. It's also that. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to go obscure. I was like, "What's a brand yeah. I haven't said tonight?" <laughs> yeah, no, no, Monteros uh, are cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, sweet. Uh, awesome. I could wrap up the show then. So, yeah. Kurt, what what would you want to plug, man? Uh, Kangaroo. Yeah, absolutely. Kangaroo Racing. We're easy to find on all of the social media world out there. Uh, you kind of follow our racing endeavors. It's just a part-time gig for all of us. We've all got normal eight to five jobs, so we're not always the best at keeping things updated, but ask questions, ask away. And then, uh, yeah, my day-to-day job is Cruiser Outfitters. We're also on all the social media or cruiseroutfitters.com and that's all we do is uh, we don't claim to know anything about other vehicles, but we, we feel pretty comfortable with uh, land cruisers at this point. We do a lot of Forerunner Tacoma GX stuff as well, Prado stuff, but uh, any Toyota 4x4 platforms, even Sequoia suspensions. So yep. we, uh, we, yeah, we're comfortable with any of the Toyota stuff. But I might, I might, yeah, I might send you an email. Yeah, yeah, dude. We'd love to help you out. It's my wife's truck now, which is hilarious. <laughs> She's going to be so pissed. Perfect time to lift it then. Perfect time. Oh, to lift it. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so Cruiser Outfitters, Kangaroo, X Overland. Yeah, don't Land Cruiser Heritage Museum. Land Cruiser Heritage Museum, yeah. Uh, the Expedition 7, you can watch videos on all the seven continents that that trip went to, taking the same Land Cruiser to all seven continents. So you can check all that out on the, it's on the Land Cruiser Museum website as well, but you can check out the videos. So yeah, a lot of content. And then of course, Exo's uh, easy to catch a lot of content on YouTube. Yes. And those, the, the Expedition 7, those were troopies, right? They, well, we had uh, two troopies, two, they're called VDJ-79. So they're okay. the uh, turbo diesel V8, turbo diesel 79 troopies, uh, sorry, 78s. And then we had 179, which is a pickup truck, a four-door truck, That's and right. then a 76, which is a four-door 70 series wagon. But only one of the vehicles, which was the VDJ-78 troopie, went to all seven continents. Okay. And that, they're all in the museum here in Salt Lake, but that one is a really cool. special one because it's got a lot of equity and a lot of travel equity underneath. Exactly. It. A lot of miles. For sure. Yeah. Well, sweet. That's awesome. Um, I don't have the show notes in front of me yet because uh, I'm on the wrong laptop. <laughs> so you'd think after 90 plus episodes of this, I'd be able to wrap it up. So <laughs> you can rate review the show on iTunes still. You can like and subscribe on YouTube uh, if you want to see some visuals. I didn't do as many as normal. I apologize. You did uh, good. It's fine. Kurt Social is at Cruiser Kurt on Instagram, at Cruiser Outfitters. Can grow racing. Uh, you can follow Hooniverse, the Hooniverse on Twitter, the real Hooniverse on Instagram. You can read what we write on Hooniverse, UTV driver, ATV rider, everyday driver. And I will plug again the Hooniverse podcast is back. Jeff Glucker yes. is recording new episodes. He got to 300 and took a two or three year hiatus. He's pretty long hiatus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he's back. He's got, I, I just now, if you, I had previously listened on Spotify. I had to research on Spotify. It's a different RSS feed, um, mm-hmm. which that might be too inside baseball for people who listen. It's a oh, different code that gets it to the audio devices. So research for the Hooniverse podcast. Make sure you find the one that has episode 301 as the first episode. Um, Ross is at No Not Like the One from Friends, and I'm at Overlanding Dad. And that's a show. That's a show. We did it. Yeah. Kurt, thank you, thank Kurt. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. It was nice to meet you, man. And Yeah, you too. Now I just got to book a trip out to visit. Uh, for real, you guys come out anytime. I'd love to show, personally show you around the museum. It's pretty fascinating. And, and uh, not just the museum. That's cool. A lot of Land Cruisers. But we got some pretty awesome terrain here in Utah. Yeah, I freaking love Utah. Utah. I did yeah. Southern Utah last October. I can't wait to get Did you? Yeah. No, I, yeah, we're pretty fortunate to have a lot of uh, public land out here to check out and explore. Yep. Yeah.